All right, let's do this one last time. The Spider-Verse movie series has been ludicrously successful in every way possible. Inspired by the 2014 Marvel event Spider-Verse, the first ever animated Spider-Man movie, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, released in 2018 to box office success and universal praise from critics and audiences alike. And when I say universal praise, I mean that people said this was one of the biggest steps forward for animation in years. And they were right. Nothing had come out like it before, with its incredibly original look and feel, with lots of experimental techniques applied to the animation, alongside a great story, direction, and characters made with love by the crew behind it. Into the Spider-Verse swept award shows, even nabbing the Oscar for Best Animated Feature that year. Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. In 2023, the sequel, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, released and was met with even bigger praise. The team said they wanted this to be their Empire Strikes Back and they succeeded with flying colors. It drew even more money in at the box office and matched the high, if not perfect, ratings of the first. And although it lost the Best Animated Picture Oscar to The Boy and the Heron, robbed if you ask me, its impact that year was undeniable. The third and seemingly final installment of the trilogy, Spider-Man Beyond the Spider-Verse, has no set release date, but we have a very rough idea of what we can expect. Spider-Man has been sent to a universe with no Spider-Man, overrun by a Sinister Six crime syndicate. He's been captured by the Prowler, revealed to be the Miles Morales of that universe. While that's going on, two separate groups are looking for him across the multiverse. Gwen Stacy and a crew she's assembled, including Peter Parker, Hobie Brown, and Penny Parker, among others. And then there's Miguel O'Hara, the Spider-Man of 2099, hunting Miles with members of the Spider Society, including Jessica Drew and Ben Riley. I think given the trend of introducing a handful of new spider people in each movie, all taken from the vast amounts of Spider-Man media made over the last 60 years, I think it wouldn't be out of the question to assume that both Gwen and Miguel would get a few other spider people to help them out. So in this video, I just want to make a wish list of the spider people I'd like to see joining the movie on either side, starting off with... Superior Spider-Man came about when a dying Dr. Octopus swapped consciousnesses with Peter Parker, leaving Peter in the dying body of Dr. Octopus while Doc Ock became Spider-Man. From there, he was determined to prove he could be the superior Spider-Man, becoming a better superhero than the original ever was. He had a good tenure, and even after the status quo was restored and Peter Parker returned, we still had a superior Spider-Man, or occasionally superior octopus, to read every so often. He has a very bold and distinctive look, opting for a wider spider emblem, a red and black color scheme instead of red and blue, disjointed webbing, and four red mechanical arms on the back similar to the Iron Spider legs. Looks like we got competition. Superior Spider-Man also had a large role to play in the original Spider-Verse event. Superior Spider-Man number 32 was the first full comic issue to start Spider-Verse, following on from a tease in the Guardians of the Galaxy and Spider-Verse free comic book day issue. Otto's been stranded in the year 2099, essentially swapping places with Miguel O'Hara, and jumps through other dimensions to try and get back to his time only to encounter lots of dead spider people. It's here that he learns of the Inheritors, the villains of the Spider-Verse story, and their plans to consume spider people from every dimension. He played a big part throughout the entire event, although he had his mind wiped of any memories from it. There's not a doubt in my mind that he'd be teaming up with Spider-Man 2099 instead of Spider-Gwen. I think it would be a bit of a hard sell for non-comic fans watching the film to have a Dr. Octopus Spider-Man who's also actively trying to help the hero. Sure, Superior Spider-Man does have heroic moments, but I think his characterization for Beyond the Spider-Verse would be better as more of an anti-hero, much like Miguel O'Hara. Characters who truly believe they're doing the right thing, but as the audience, we know they're not. Spider-Man. In the 1970s, Spider-Man was licensed out to the Toei Company in Japan to create what's called a tokusatsu series, essentially meaning a series with a really heavy reliance on practical special effects. Think of something like early Godzilla as an example. This time around, Spider-Man is Takuya Yamashiro, a motorcyclist who encounters an alien called Garia from Planet Spider, who has been sending him psychic messages after being captured by one Professor Monster. On his way to find Garia, Takuya finds his father has been killed by one of Monster's creations. He eventually finds Garia, who gifts him with the Spider Bracelet and the Spider Extract powerful items that let him become Spider-Man. He also takes control of a massive mech called Leopardon, which would later go on to inspire the Megazords in the Power Rangers franchise. From then on, he would protect the world from Professor Monster's threats as Spider-Man. He also became infamous among Spider-People for describing himself as an emissary from hell. As far as I can tell, that's a title he bestowed upon himself. No one gave it to him. Spider-Man! 
The TV series ran for 41 episodes and a movie, with some of the most insane scenes to come from a Spider-Man project I think I've ever seen. In the years since his show, Toei Spider-Man hasn't been forgotten, appearing in both the original Spider-Verse event and its follow-up Spider-Geddon. Which is why Toei Spider-Man was the most surprising omission from across the Spider-Verse. It's clear that he's one of the most beloved adaptations of Spider-Man, so to find out that there's literally zero representation for him in either Spider-Verse movie is baffling. The three biggest live-action Spider-Man all got some representation, either through a visual or through some dialogue. You don't even get me started on Doctor Strange, you little nerd back on Earth 1999-99. Perhaps it's the fact that he is live-action, since it's clear that Spider-People from outside the comics are being represented as close to their original format as possible. For example, the Insomniac Spider-Man is represented using his actual model from the Spider-Man 2 PS5 game, and is running at a much smoother frame rate than everyone else to resemble a high FPS game character. Making Takuya a prominent character would probably mean a lot more live action filming, which might be a stretch too far for the production team. I mean, they're wizards over there, but not quite gods. Not yet, at least. But in terms of teams, he would absolutely side with Gwen, the man with burning passion seemed to have a very strong sense of justice, while also having a good-natured spirit. I can see him being horrified by Miguel's plans, even going out of his way to prevent him from carrying them out. This is one of the only Spider-Men to use a gun outside of the Fortnite ones, so really anything is possible. <laughs> The current run of Amazing Spider-Man has been received incredibly poorly. Between having Spider-Man working for Oscorp and becoming a spider goblin, splitting Peter and MJ up so that MJ can be with a guy called Paul, killing off one of the most popular new Marvel characters of the 21st century, Miss Marvel, and becoming spider goblin again. It's, it's happening again. Fans are begging for a new start while turning to far better received Spider-Man series. But in the Amazing Spider-Man's dark web arc, we get introduced to one of the most goofy spider people of all, Wreck Rap. Initially a demon from Limbo, he's saved from a bigger demon by Peter Parker, who he begins idolizing. He eventually bonds with a symbiote which emulates his Spider-Man t-shirt and gains his own spider-like abilities. He describes himself as the web-wanging warrior due to his ability to... web-wang. It's essentially web-swinging and web-shooting, but he strictly defines it as web-wanging. He makes his own sound effects which are never consistent, and he teams up with the actual Spider-Man to defeat Chasm, the newest identity of Ben Riley. He's rather bulky in stature, a big departure from his pre-symbiote appearance. We also see more of his physical body appearing through the suit, including his massive toothy grin and tongue. His colour scheme matches Spider-Man's classic suit, although his spider emblem more closely resembles the one we see on the back of Spider-Man. I can see Retcrap going either way, honestly. As long as his admiration for Peter is presented, they could really have some fun with it. Maybe he's declaring his intentions to help Gwen, but Miguel pulls out a random Peter Parker to convince him to stay, something Retcrap is very easily convinced of. But there may be other factors at play. Ben Riley rejected Retcrap from his Insidious Six, as he only wanted villains and Retcrap was deemed too heroic an aspiration. Perhaps Miguel keeping Ben in his inner circle will rub him the wrong way, but I think whichever side of the conflict he's on, It'll be for one ridiculous reason or another. Hida Haruka, aka Sakura Spider, is a character co-created between Marvel and Shueisha, a Japanese manga publisher who print Weekly Shonen Jump. Weekly Shonen Jump is the premier comic publication in Japan, specialising in action series for teenage boys and young adults, including One Piece, Jojo's Bizarre Adventure, and My Hero Academia. She has a fairly standard origin story with the radioactive spider bite, loss of a loved one, and taking the phrase, with great power there must also come great responsibility, as her new mantra. She's from Earth 346, a universe set for the Marvel and Shonen Jump creations. We first meet Sakura Spider in Deadpool Samurai, where she's assigned to the Samurai Squad, an Avengers team set up in Japan. She's joined by Deadpool, much to her dismay, as they try to stop Loki from assembling a team of villains to destroy Japan. They encounter a symbiote attached to an idol singer, Thanos comes crashing in at the end of Volume 1, and there's even a crossover with My Hero Academia, which sees All Might and Deadpool teaming up to fight Thanos. This is the crossover that dreams are made of. They even recreate a little scene from the first volume of My Hero Academia, which is nice. Please sign my notebook! We'd later see Sakura Spider reappear in Deadpool, Black, White and Blood, and Edge of Spider-Verse in 2022. Sakura Spider sports a black, white and pink suit, 
opting for no mask, but instead a large hood with spider eyes and webs on it. Her web shooters are also far larger than most other spider peoples, being massive orbs on her wrists. Her design has been compared to Ochako Uraraka from My Hero Academia for their similarities, and yeah, I can see it. Since her primary appearances have been in the Deadpool Samurai manga series, it'd be cool to see her style in Beyond the Spider-Verse reflect that, with the black and white colouring similar to noir, except with far lighter elements than dark. Sakura Spider, weirdly enough, I can see being more on Miguel's side. She is a lot more no-nonsense than most spider people, not being super jokey or funny. She lets her guard down occasionally, mostly to do with her being a fan of the idol they're trying to save, something Deadpool notes as being really out of character. But she's very by the books, which Gwen's current team are the exact opposite of at the moment. So I can see Sakura Spider teaming up with Miguel. To be clear from the start, this is specifically talking about the 2024 Ultimate Spider-Man. It wouldn't really be possible to do the original Ultimate Spider-Man since his role is already taken by this guy. There's only one Spider-Man and you're looking at him. Ultimate Spider-Man rises after the events of Ultimate Invasion, when an evil version of Reed Richards called The Maker tries to shape a new universe as he sees fit by preventing the existence of certain superheroes and controlling the ones that do exist. And the first time we see him do this is by catching a spider in a test tube that was about to bite one Peter Parker. 20 years later, a 35-year-old Peter is married to MJ and has two kids, but he still feels like something in his life is unfulfilled. That is, until he sent a package from the future by Tony Stark, aka Iron Lad. Inside it is a Picotech suit and the very same spider that the maker had taken, which he accepts to bite him and he becomes Spider-Man. Writer Jonathan Hickman stated that Peter B. Parker from the Spider-Verse movies was a direct inspiration for Ultimate Spider-Man, which would initially make it seem redundant to include him. However, I'd argue they're both just using the same creative starting point, an adult Peter Parker as Spider-Man. Peter B. Parker has been Spider-Man since he was 15, and at this point has 23 years of experience. He's seemingly gone through all the main canon events, including Spider-Man No More, the death of the Stacys, the Black Suit Saga, etc. But Ultimate Peter Parker, as of the time of writing this, has just under six months of experience. So far, we've only seen him face the Shocker, Bullseye, and if you want to count him, Green Goblin. He has a very unique perspective we've never seen before, a fresh look at the world of Spider-Man from someone who's already grown and matured. Not to mention he's got an incredibly unconventional origin story, given that it was interrupted by the maker. So if he was part of the Spider-Verse movies, there's no way Miguel would be taking him on his side. I think that Ultimate's newfound belonging and fulfillment in being Spider-Man would skew him more towards helping Gwen's team to save Miles rather than capture him. Not to mention Miles and Ultimate Peter could probably bond over the link of unconventional or unexpected origin stories. That's only a small handful of spider people we could see in Beyond the Spider-Verse. I know a lot of people are expecting more popular spider people to appear, like the three live action movie Spider-Man, the 90s series Spider-Man, Web of Shadow Spider-Man, essentially, everyone wants to see the adaptations they grew up with. But these were five spider people that maybe people hadn't considered yet. And when it comes to spider people, the web of them just seems endless. I hadn't even mentioned characters like Kane, Life Story Spider-Man, Aaron Aikman, the numerous video game Spider-Men, and even the ones from the bad and really bad TV shows. We could even be silly and mention completely unofficial Spider-Men that have zero chance of getting in. Coming from parodies, You don't know Spider-Man? He sticks to walls like this. or fan project interpretations, except not you. We still don't know when Beyond the Spider-Verse is releasing, and knowing my luck with these videos, the release date and new cast members may well be revealed in the couple of days before and after this goes up. But regardless of how long it takes, I can't wait to see a movie focused exclusively on a new batch of spider people Oh yeah, I, I, I forgot the spot is like, the main threat of the next movie. Uh... I have to go now. My planet needs me. Wow. The spot. Came from another planet? Uh, I guess. Hey, that wasn't supposed to happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah.